Good afternoon, everybody. This is David Cerns from Haley Marketing Group, and welcome to today's Lunch with Haley event. Uh, today, we are going to take a look at a lot of different types of marketing. And in fact, um, this is a topic that's come up because I've seen a lot of staffing companies that either don't do much of any marketing or get very, very focused on one tool as the absolute best way to market uh, to the exclusion of everything else. So put together today's webinar in order to help everybody to get a better appreciation of uh, the value of different types of marketing and more importantly uh, when and where to use the marketing for sales lead generation, helping you to nurture leads with clients and prospects and of course right now for recruiting as well. So let's, uh, let's jump right in. All right, let's kind of kick things off. You know, I love this statement. You know, when you own a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And this is really why this presentation exists. You know, for years and years and years, the staffing industry's main hammer has been the telephone. Uh, and, and probably over the last uh, 20 years, it's converted to being more email. So when we think about business development, when we think about recruiting, uh, the, the hammer we have is the phone and our email and, you know, every prospect looks like that nail we're trying to drive in. Every candidate is somebody we can just reach out to uh, with our email and our telephone. And probably over the last five to seven years, you know, we've seen LinkedIn jump up and so we have one more hammer that we're using. We can try to reach out to everybody uh, via LinkedIn. What I'm seeing though is there's a lot of confusion over the role and value of marketing and that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, companies that are expecting way too much out of some channels and completely ignoring others that might be very profitable. There's also in the industry just this general fear to make intelligent investments in marketing and in supporting the sales team. Um, it's interesting because the industry will spend a lot on recruiting and comparatively little on helping their most expensive resources, their salespeople, to be more effective in their jobs. So, you know, as an industry, uh, the data says that we spend between 0.25 and 0.4 percent of sales on marketing and if you compare that to other industries you know, even if you normalize for it being a percentage of gross margin we're spending one to one and a half percent of gross margin on marketing and in other industries that's typically five or ten percent of their gross revenues so we as an industry spend way less supporting our salespeople even though we as an industry are much more sales driven than lots of other industries. And right now in today's super competitive talent market, um, we'll look at the value of recruiting and how to use some of these tools, low cost and even no cost, to help you get more people coming to your website and applying to your jobs. But before we get into the specific tools, I want to talk with everybody about you know, the purpose of marketing. Why do we do this? Yes, I'm the CEO of a marketing company, and so of course I believe in marketing. But we've been working with the staffing industry for more than 20 years, and I've had a few more years before that in marketing in the staffing industry. And I've come to see there is a lot of different value that marketing can deliver, and most companies aren't extracting the full value from their marketing function. So, you know, what is the purpose of marketing? Well, first and foremost, it's to get people's attention. You know, we're dealing in a super competitive marketplace, and, and not just to sell staffing services against your direct competitors, but you've got a super competitive market just for people's time and attention. So if I want to jump out in someone's email or get them to take my phone call, what can I do to really better get their attention prior to picking up the phone? I don't want to just capture attention though, I also want to convey a message, a message about my organization, uh, a message about the value that I can deliver, a message about what makes me special, and what makes me different, which sort of brings us to our next point. The purpose of marketing is to help you differentiate, maybe. So for some staffing companies, some people on today's call, you guys have a real difference. You have service process difference, you have a market focus difference, you have an access to talent difference, and marketing can help you convey that differentiation. 
But for a lot of staffing companies, you know, what you do is fairly similar to what other staffing companies do. And you may be better in some areas, your competitors may be better in some areas. So very often staffing isn't, or excuse me, marketing isn't just about differentiation. But what it's really about is sparking interest in a conversation. How do I get the prospect to want to talk to me even though I don't look radically different than somebody else? And candidly, when you're selling to HR people, being radically different scares them. So we want to spark interest in a conversation and build trust with them, but not necessarily differentiate that strongly. And I know everyone else who's a marketing professional on today's call is probably going to throw a stone at me, um, but I really think it's more about creating conversations than true differentiation from the other 17,000 staffing companies that are out there. One of the critical roles of marketing is to help you stay top of mind. You know, I haven't met a single staffing company anywhere in the world that is really good at one call closes. And because it's going to take time, sometimes weeks, sometimes months, sometimes years, until that prospect you're calling on is willing to give you a shot at their business, we need to do something to stay top of mind. And there, there are not enough hours in the day for your sales team to stay top of mind with every client, every prospect, and every candidate. So marketing's job is to fill in the gaps, to help you nurture relationships, to help you stay in front of people, to help you be the top of mind staffing firm so when that need arises, you're the company they think of first. Probably what's most important is Nothing in marketing is going to change the fact that staffing is a sales-driven industry, and marketing's role is not to replace sales. It is to make your sales and recruiting efforts more productive. How can we help you get in front of more people? So you know, a really good example is a client we were working with to develop a marketing message that would help their sales team successfully close more appointments. And I won't get into the details of the campaign, but what we did was we came up with a great story that was not about what this company did, but that was about the value of their approach to staffing. We used direct marketing to convey that message, and we used some really attention-grabbing um, images and some attention-grabbing data to capture attention. And then we had the salespeople follow up. And what happened as a result of doing this pre-marketing prior to the sales call is their cold call was now a warm call and their call to appointment ratio went up by a hundred percent. They basically doubled the face time the salespeople had just by adding marketing into the mix before the call. But we also want to add marketing in after the call to do that keeping you top of mind so that and, and also giving your salespeople reasons to make more follow-up calls. Of course, marketing, part of your role is to attract clients and candidates. You've probably all heard the term inbound marketing, getting leads to come inbound to you, and that's exactly what we want to do. Somewhere between 20 and 40% of your new business should be inbound. Uh, almost all of your recruiting, except for your high-level direct recruiting, is going to be inbound marketing. Uh, and there are a lot of things that we're going to look at today beyond just posting jobs and sponsoring jobs that you can do to generate inbound recruiting. And lastly, we're not going to talk about this a ton today, but part of marketing's role is to enhance or improve the service experience. Because ultimately, you know, what differentiates your company from the competition is the overall experience a client has or a candidate has in working with you. It can be tied to your quality and your speed of service. It can be tied to your flexibility and your caring. It can, but it's really about the entire package. Do you deliver a better experience? And marketing's role is to help ensure continuity in that experience to help you do things like onboard talent, to help you onboard clients, to help you ensure people get a consistent introduction to your firm. There's a lot of things that can be done with marketing to enhance your service process so that it's a better, more consistent experience for every client and, and every candidate. You know, if you're a Haley Marketing client on today's call and you've had us build a website, you've seen this in action. So we use marketing automation as a way to follow up with every new website owner to provide ongoing training through the first couple of months of their new website, showing them how to get better value out of their site, how to edit the site, and a combination of marketing collateral that we've created through videos. You'll see more about that later. Marketing automation, email marketing, 
all together help ensure a better experience for our clients. And you can do the exact same thing in improving service for your clients. Okay, so if marketing has all these incredible values, uh, what's the problem that we're trying to deal with today? Well, the problem is because using the wrong tools, because a lot of companies are using the wrong tools, or using tools the wrong way, we see a lot of very common marketing mistakes being made. First off is messaging. So either companies have no message. They send something out to the marketplace that basically says functionally, here's what we do. Here's our temporary staffing. Here's our temp to hire. Here's our direct hire. Here's the geographic market we serve. Or here's the niche industry we serve. But that messaging is boring. It doesn't stand out. It doesn't differentiate. It doesn't build credibility. Messaging has to be concise. It has to be clear. It has to be powerful. It has to be compelling. And very few staffing companies spend time really planning their messaging and even worse, uh, ensuring that the message is consistently delivered by every piece of marketing collateral, your website, every salesperson, every recruiter, right up to the receptionist who answers the phone. That messaging has to be core to your communication. All right, next one, making the assumption that the competition sucks. I've seen this time and time again. Companies are trained to believe that what they do is better than everybody else, and at the same time, they're sort of believing that means what everybody else is doing is really weak. Um, they're not focusing very hard on quality. It's all about just dumping resumes on people, and they don't do follow-up, and they don't really care about their customers. Well, guess what? In, in all the years that I've been doing marketing in the staffing industry, I've yet to see a company that doesn't care, that doesn't try hard. I know. There are some out there. We've seen the damage they've done to the staffing industry. But if you go in assuming the competition is weak, you're going to assume it's easy to compete. You're better to assume your competition is really good. And now you have to ask yourself, if my client or my prospect is dealing with a company that's really good, how do I get them to switch to us? What value can I deliver that that company is not delivering? What problem can I solve? How can I up the game for the service experience and deliver something they can't compete with? If you assume the competition is great, you'll make better marketing decisions than when you assume the competition is weak. Uh, the next mistake is, and this particularly happens for CEOs, you know, we tend to assume that everybody else views the world just like we do. Well, they don't. So maybe you're someone who loves email and you assume all marketing should be done by email. Or maybe the opposite, saying my inbox has 200 unread messages in it. The last thing in the world I want is more email marketing. So every person has different styles, different preferences, and in marketing we tend to try to build personas, uh, a description of a target audience. And so for a typical staffing company, there's probably a whole bunch of personas. There's your small business owner persona. There's your HR manager persona. There's your frontline supervisor persona. There's different candidate personas. And you define in aggregate what are these audiences like. And then you try to think about how to best reach and motivate those groups of people. But don't assume they're going to respond the same way you do. The next mistake is a lack of perspective. Because we sell staffing for a living, we assume that staffing is really important to everyone we talk to. And unfortunately, I wish that were the case, but it's not. We've been doing email marketing and content marketing for 20 years, email marketing since 1999. And if I look at the emails that our team has sent out that get the worst readership rates, they're emails about staffing. The emails that get the best readership rates are emails that are timely and about the problems and interests that your clients and prospects and candidates have right now. They're dealing with the kinds of business problems. They're dealing with really tactical challenges that people have. So we have to keep perspective when we're marketing to someone that how they spend their day is not necessarily how we want them to spend their day. Most of what they're doing is focused on something outside of staffing. So if we're going to try to interrupt their day and get them to pay attention to us, we have to have perspective to what it's like to be in their shoes and then design our marketing so that they can relate to it and so that it motivates them. Uh, the next mistake has to do with the whole world of social media. Now, social media is great, don't get me wrong, I love it. But I see staffing companies making two mistakes. Number one, they either 
don't believe social media works at all and so they don't do anything with it. In the worst cases, they block their team or have policies prohibiting their teams from using social media. That's a really bad idea because it's been documented that organizations and salespeople that integrate social media into their selling process are significantly, I believe it's 80 some odd percent more productive than sales reps who just rely on email, telephone, and drop buys. But the, the other extreme is just as bad. Companies that believe social media is the answer to everything and you know all I need is to get more social media and it will solve all of our recruiting and staffing problems. Social media is a great tool. We're going to talk more about it later, but it's not the end-all be-all of marketing and it's also not something you can afford to ignore. Another big problem we see is when companies have multiple salespeople and they allow the salespeople to control the message they send. And what I mean by this is they'll give the salesperson a phone, an Outlook account, um, sometimes a cell phone, they'll give them a CRM staffing software, and they'll say go sell. But what they don't give them are sample emails to use, scripted emails that can be easily modified for different prospects. They don't coach the salesperson on how to convey the company message on the value they deliver. They don't ensure continuity from one salesperson to another, from sales to recruiting. And when we let everybody in the organization create their own variation of our company message, we kind of a, a mess, a mixed up, dulled down version of what we want to say. And when we convey a variety of different messages to the marketplace, we're not going to stand out, we're not going to be memorable, we're not going to be credible with the people we're trying to sell to. So we really need to take and centralize control over those messages and give salespeople the tools, which we'll talk more about later, to ensure they're communicating as effectively as possible. Oh, one of my favorites. I tried it once and it didn't work. I hear that about email. I hear that about direct mail. I hear that about social media. I hear that about uh, online advertising. There's probably no marketing tactic that I've tried over the years that at one time didn't work. But it's not because the marketing tactic doesn't work. It's usually because something we did in the execution was faulty. Maybe we had the, the wrong audience. Maybe we had too small of an audience. Maybe we tried to target too many people. Maybe we had a weak offer or a weak copy. Maybe our landing page wasn't properly designed. Maybe we didn't integrate sales follow-up effectively enough. Maybe we just didn't give it long enough to take hold. We quit too soon. So if you've tried something and it fails, that's not an indicator that marketing has failed. It's an indicator that I've learned something. And I tested a hypothesis that didn't work. How can I tweak it? Now, sometimes you will find things that just for your business are not effective and you shouldn't reinvest in them. Okay, that's fine. But sometimes you'll find things where if I had done this a little bit differently, if I had changed the headline of this email, maybe I would get a different result. You know, In our own recruiting efforts for our company, we did the same job title with three different excuse me, the same job with three different job titles. Well, the first time we did it, we had zero job applications. Does that mean our, our recruitment marketing didn't work? We then changed the job title. No other changes. The same distribution channels for the job. And with two different job titles, one produced 25 applications, the other 125. The only difference was one thing, the job title. The channels for marketing and recruiting didn't change at all. What didn't work was our headline. And the same thing can happen in your marketing. If you have things that don't work, don't give up on them. Analyze them. Figure out what might be broken. Test something new and then make it better. Figure out if it can work. And again, it doesn't mean everything is going to work for your business, but don't give up just because something doesn't work once. Uh, related to that is being one-dimensional, only having one way to generate sales leads. So as some of you may have heard from past webinars that uh, I've had the honor of hosting, I'm a big fan of a book called The Ultimate Sales Machine by a guy named Chet Holmes. It's a book that's several years old now. It's probably more than a decade old now. And it talks about different strategies for sales and marketing. I like it because it's sort of like a playbook as to how to do everything right with your marketing. And in that book, Chet says that business should have at least 12 different ways to generate sales leads. So how many do you have in your company? Are you just using the telephone? Are you just using outbound sales? Do you have an inbound strategy? Do you have an event marketing strategy? Do you have a referral strategy? Do you have a paid advertising strategy? How many different ways do you have to generate leads? Uh, the more different lead generation funnels you create, obviously the more leads you will have and the easier it will be to sell and the faster your business will grow. And most staffing firms don't have more than a couple 
tactics that they are using to generate sales leads. So if you want to dominate your market, do more than your competition is doing. Um, next thing is being impatient. Marketing takes time. And as I mentioned a minute ago, you know, sometimes it can be a one day or two day response. Sometimes it's a couple of weeks. Sometimes it's a couple of months. Sometimes it can be years. So with marketing, we have to figure out based on the tactic we're using, how long should we give it? You know, an email campaign is relatively fast. So direct mail campaign takes, while, takes a much longer time. And for example, you know, when we go to a trade show, uh, we don't know for six months whether or not the trade show was really a good investment because it takes that long to finish closing leads. Also, when you're looking at the value of a marketing tool, you have to figure out how long we're going to count results for. So if I get one new client and I only count the first sale from that client, that's very different than if I look at the lifetime value of that client. And maybe the lifetime value is an average of $10,000 a year in 10 years. So that's a $100,000 client. Whereas that first sale maybe was only $1,000 in gross margin. So if I'm too impatient in either waiting for the campaign to work or in how I measure results, I'm not going to make smart marketing investments. And lastly, our industry is cheap. As I mentioned, we don't invest enough in marketing. We spend 20% of what most other industries spend as a percentage of our revenues on marketing. We don't do it. I can't answer why. I'm, there's definitely been a trend to invest more in marketing. We spend a ton on salespeople. We spend a ton on recruiters. We have very high payrolls. We spend a ton on commission dollars. But wouldn't we love it if we could take that salesperson and make them two, three, four times productive just by putting marketing around their current processes? Wouldn't we love it if we could change our recruiting spend and by adding marketing in different places be able to spend a lot less on job posts and on sponsoring jobs? If we invest the right ways, if we invest in doing things well, we can generate significantly more results than trying to do things as cheaply as possible. And I will say, you know, almost every prospect, every company that calls us, the first question is, what's this going to cost? Not, what will it cost to do it right? All right, it's time to jump into the tools. So we're going to start with the most important tool that every staffing company has, your website. So in staffing today, you know, what is the value of having a website? Is it really, you know, is it a necessity? Yes. What do we need to do with a website? Well, first off, the value of your website is it sets the stage. You know, it's sort of your virtual office or your online showroom. It sets the stage for how people perceive you. So you're going to have at least a thousand times more people visiting your website than ever step foot in your offices. Uh, you know, maybe tens of thousands times more people on your website. If you look at your Google Analytics, you probably have anywhere from 50 to 500 to a couple thousand people a day who hit your website that are looking for jobs, that are looking for information about your services, and they're making a determination about what they think about your business based on what they see. So you have to make sure that your website sets the stage for how you are perceived. And I know a lot of staffing companies that have beautiful lobbies and they've spent more on the furniture in their lobby than they did on their website. Yet more people are going to make an impression of that organization by what they see online and on their phone than what they see in your office. Your website's also your first step to taking action. It's the first step in getting a candidate to apply or a prospect agreeing to meet. You know, after somebody sees your job post, where do they go? your website. After your salesperson makes a cold call, where does the prospect go? Your website. After somebody gets a referral to you, where do they go before they call you? Your website. So your website has to not only look good, not only convey a great message, but it's got to get people towards taking the actions you want them to take. And your website is going to make or break your positioning. You know, if you say we are a high quality, top-notch staffing organization dedicated to a high level of service and your website looks like you spent $1.98, well that incongruity between what you say and what you invested in your website is going to show to prospects. It's going to show to candidates. And when they look at the website and it's a pile of junk, it's out of date, so they're going to say, you know what, they say good things, but this is not a good company. They're not going to trust you. Any part of your messaging that's inconsistent, you'll be known for by your weakest link. So you want to make sure that your website is one of your strongest links in positioning your firm, letting people know what you do, what you stand for, telling your story the way you want it told. In fact, 
that is exactly the role of your website is to create the right first impression so when people come you have the ability to tell them your story the way you want it told so whether you want to be seen as the fastest the biggest the smartest the most responsive the highest customer service focus that message has to come out immediately you have about three to ten seconds from the time someone hits your home page to get that first impression through to initiate that story if your website's first three to ten seconds are a, only a giant picture that's not good you need some text if your website has too much text and people have to read it all to figure out your your story that's also not good you have to make it concise so you have to make sure you're creating a strong first impression that I can pick up in three to ten seconds your website's also going to be about building credibility through testimonials case studies examples of work you've done for specific clients in specific industries I know a lot of staffing companies don't like to list their clients for fear their competitors will call on those companies well, guess what? Your competitors are already calling on those companies. The companies you serve are one of your best credibility builders. And that's why if you look at almost every technology company, right on the homepage will be the logos of all the companies they serve. I see a lot of IT staffing firms who do the same thing. And I've asked them, hey, did you get permission from those companies to put the logos in your website? And they say, no, we didn't. We put them on there. And as soon as they say take them off, we will. They've never been asked to take them off. Now, if you've got clients where you've signed contracts that explicitly say you will not use our name in your marketing, don't do it. But leverage who your clients are. Leverage your success stories. Leverage your testimonials on your website, on your homepage, and throughout your site to build credibility for your ability to solve problems, deliver value that the competition can't match. Your website should also be a hub for sharing content. Um, one of the things I like to think about a website is, is sort of like a funnel. Everything you do out in the world of social media, email marketing, even the telephone, that's above the funnel. You're trying to get people into your funnel, and the very top of that funnel is your website. The bottom of the funnel is where they're, where they're applying to a job or they're placing a job order with you. The content, the website content in the middle, that's the hub. So I want everything I do out in the online world and sometimes even in the physical world to drive people back to that content hub because once they're at the website at that content hub I can then encourage them to take the actions I want them to take now your website should also be built in such a way that it attracts employers and job seekers and this is the role of SEO search engine optimization if you've got a great content hub and you're constantly adding optimized pages to your site and you're constantly adding great information for employers and job seekers, and you're constantly adding jobs that are optimized, your site is going to be found on Google searches. It's going to be found on social media, assuming you're sharing on social media, and that will attract people to your website, which will generate more inbound sales leads. And really, your website is about getting people to take action. You know, whether they apply to a job, whether they contact you for services, or maybe this is something as simple as opting in for a newsletter downloading a publication or watching a video you're sharing or something like we're doing today, you know, signing up to watch a webinar. The idea is to get people to take action so you can start to build a relationship with these people even before you know their name. So how do you build a great website? Well, step number one is to think about information flow. Who's coming to our website? Sure, we've got prospects, we've got job candidates, we've also got existing temporary associates that we're placing. We've got existing clients and everybody coming to your website is interested in different information. So how do we create an information flow that allows people to get what they're looking for as easily as possible? And step one in designing a website is to think about that flow. You also want to make sure you have a clear, concise message. I mentioned the three to ten seconds. So how do I very quickly, in a couple of sentences, think like a billboard as you're zooming down the highway, how do I get my first message into someone's mind as concisely as possible? And then as I go through the pages of your website, how do I make it really simple to read? And how do I make the copy as short as possible where I still convey all the meaning we need to convey? want to make sure the website also has a bold design that matches your desired image and you know so often we get the requests from organizations saying you know what can you please put a photo on our website and we have to make sure that we're non-discriminatory so please try to show as many different uh, ethnicities as you can and oh by the way we, we staff for five or six different job titles so can you please show lots of different people in those roles all in one picture and so you end up with the same, you know, there's I think three stock photos that we all have, the uh, same mix of people of seven different nationalities in 
seven different jobs standing next to each other, smiling and looking very unrealistic. Be bold, take risks. Uh, some of our clients will go really far out on a limb and I love when they do that because it makes their website stand out. Now, some of our clients um, would cringe at what these other firms do. You don't want to go so bold that it doesn't match your company's branding. But if you're even, if, you, if you're saying, you know, our goal is to be very corporate, very professional, still try to find imagery that's bold and don't look like everybody else and don't just insist on smiling people on your website because if that's all you have, your website's going to look like everybody else and it's not going to stand out. Make sure your website has simple calls to action all over the place. Simple calls to action can be text in the body copy. It can be graphics that tell people what to do. Uh, it can be fly-ins or pop-ups that allow people to take the next step. I was on a beautiful website today. Somebody inquired. I went to their website. And after about 30 seconds, a very nice pop-up appeared on the middle of their homepage encouraging me to sign up for their newsletter. And it was extremely well done. It's a great example of a simple call to action. They didn't just say, hey, get our newsletter. They told me what the newsletter was about, why I would want to sign up very concisely, and made it one, just enter my email address and I was done. One line, done. Super simple. But you want to make sure that every page on your website drives people to do something next, that it has a call to action. Make sure you have a smart approach to mobile. And you know, everybody talks about being responsive, meaning the site adjusts from your desktop to your tablet to your phone, sort of like the picture on the screen. But that's not all you have to do to be ready for mobile is to be responsive. You also have to think about how is a mobile user going to use the site? What can I do differently on mobile? Maybe I want less content. Maybe I want shorter content. Uh, we, when we design sites, a lot of times we'll put quick action buttons at the bottom of a web page that stay at the bottom of every page so that if I want to contact the company by phone or send them an email or get directions or search jobs, those buttons are always visible. and I, as a job seeker or a client, can get access to the information I most want without ever having to surf around the website. Have a content strategy. So if you think about what you're trying to do with your website is to attract people, and if you're thinking about attracting people from social and search, I have to have content that's going to get found in searches and that people would be interested in when it's shared on social media. So I need a strategy. What is that content? How am I going to add pages for our specialties? How am I going to add pages for our locations? How am I going to add jobs to the site and blog posts to make sure everything's optimized for SEO? I need a strategy where we're planning our content and regularly adding it to the site. And lastly, make sure you're, a great, you're tracking. A great website uses Google Analytics to track exactly how people are using the site. And you look at the analytics to see where are people coming from? Where are they going? How long do they stay on the pages? When do they leave? So that you can make improvements to keep people longer and get them to the actions you want them to take. And you can also integrate it with marketing automation. So as people come into your site, you can track their visits. And then you can report to your sales team, hey, Joe Smith's been to our site five times in the last month. It's probably time to give Joe a call. Or Jane Doe just looked at four different candidates in our talent showcase. Maybe we want to talk to Jane. Okay, so that's a quick overview for websites. If you want more information on building a great website, you know, go to our website, go to the freebie section, and download our killer staffing website guide. It's got awesome ideas to help you build a really great website. Or if you prefer to watch a, a webinar, go to our Lunch with Haley website, go to the on-demand webinars, and watch the webinar our creative team put on last year on creating a killer staffing website. Awesome information and a lot more detail than I have time to get into today. All right, let's change gears. And we're going to talk about one of my favorite areas of marketing and one the staffing industry totally underuses, direct mail. So what is the value of direct mail? And a lot of people say, David, isn't that old school? Who does direct mail? Well, I really like direct mail for a simple reason. It's a tool to capture attention. Uh, the analogy I love to use is think Think of direct mail as the express line at the supermarket. You know, the regular line is email or LinkedIn or other social media. It's a super long line. Everybody's in it. It's jam crowded and you can't tell the difference from one to the next. But direct mail, I have complete control. I can make sure you open my mail. I can guarantee it. I can provide captivating information that gets you really to pay attention to a message. I can have fun with the message. I can create a stronger impression of my organization. I can 
do things that I can't do through any other media. I can tell a wonderful story that intrigues you and makes you want to talk to me. I can get you to go to a website by creating intrigue in what's coming next. What haven't I told you? Uh, I can drive action. And that's my ideal goal. Get you to call me. Get you to visit a website. Get you to take another step because you like the direct mail piece. Or if I'm going to a conference, I can send a direct mail piece that makes you come to my booth to talk to me. But at a minimum, I can warm up the sales call. I can do something that no one else is doing so that when the salesperson calls, their sales efforts already stand out. But direct mail isn't just about initial prospecting. It's also a great way to nurture relationships. So direct mail is a perfect way to educate. You can take information about the value of staffing, how to work with your organization, how to solve business problems, how to hire better, how to recruit better. You can educate people so you're demonstrating your expertise and strengthening your positioning. Because well-designed direct mail um, reinforces your brand, shows off your expertise, can position you as a thought leader, and just as importantly, it gives your salespeople a reason to make follow-up calls because it gives them a topic to talk about that's not just staffing. One thing, I, other point I want to make about direct mail is, you know, it doesn't have to be mail. All of the pieces you see on screen can be mailed out, dropped off, um, they can be sent over by a courier, they can be put in a FedEx package. There's so many different ways to get printed materials to people, but the value is in opening doors, capturing attention, creating intrigue, and then also ongoing to nurture relationships. So what does it take to have a successful direct mail campaign? Well, as you can see on screen, um, you really, really want to be bold. Bold design, bold messaging, bold packaging. Now, this is sort of an extreme example. Um, you've got a donkey who's about nine inches tall in a four-inch by nine-inch black box holding a card that says, because hiring is a pain in the ass. And then it talks about how Key Resource Group makes hiring easier. This is a really bold example, but it's something that's not going to be missed when it hits a prospect's desk. And that's what you want to do with your direct mail. If you're going to make the investment in direct mail, and direct mail is expensive, then you want to make sure that no prospect misses your message. And you do that through the design, the message itself, and how you package it. You also want to integrate it with sales. In a lot of industries, you may be able to do just marketing, just direct mail, and get a big response. Well, staffing is too competitive. And so when we integrate marketing campaigns with sales, we want to make sure that it's a process, that we're going to do steps one, two, three, four, five, and the salesperson knows those five steps. And maybe step one is a teaser, and step two is a big get-your-attention piece, and step three is a call. Step four is an email follow-up. So we're going to integrate what the salesperson does with the materials. And we're going to show the salesperson a process. And then we're going to break it down and not target so many people at once that the salesperson can't follow up. So as I mentioned, if week three, your step three was a follow-up, then every single week I might start a new batch of people on step one. And the following week, those people would be on step two, but I'd start a new batch of people on step one. And the week after that, I have some new people on step one, some people on step two, and my step three people are getting their first calls. And then from that week forward, every week there's people at step three. The sales rep has new people to call. And you do that until the salesperson gets overloaded, that there's too many people to be following up with. And usually that's probably a couple hundred prospects. But by keeping it in small batches like that and integrating it with sales, you ensure every prospect gets followed up with and you provide a really good game plan for sales for generating appointments. Invest in doing it well. If you're going to do direct mail, spend the money to get people's attention, to have a professional looking piece. Uh, don't go halfway. If you're going to go halfway, don't go at all. Think multiple touches. So I mentioned a campaign, step one, be a teaser, step two, be an attention grabber. And that's, there's no magic to the order, but we have to think multiple touches because I might not hit somebody the first try. Now, if I send a Federal Express or a priority mail or a big dimension mail or a box, uh, the odds are pretty good 
that near 100%, it's going to get opened. And so I'm going to follow up right after that. But that's a touch. And then I want to follow up after that because they might not take my call on the follow-up. So I don't want to give up. So I want to do something where I've got three, four, five, six touches and probably through different channels of communication, not just mail. But I might, if it's, if it's local, I might drop something off. I might do mail. Uh, I might follow up with email. I'd connect on LinkedIn. So I'm touching people through different channels. I'm integrating it with sales. And I'm being really bold and aggressive about how I go after these prospects. I want to drive people, if possible, to a landing page. And the reason for this is when you drive people to the only action is to talk to a salesperson, a lot of people don't want to talk to a salesperson, and they get scared. So rather than follow up with you, they do nothing. They throw your package in the garbage. When you have a landing page, it's a less threatening way for someone to respond. They can go to that landing page. They can watch a video. They can read what you have to share. They can download something. And if you create the landing page so that there's some lead capture there, if they're interested in speaking with you, they can. If they're interested in just getting some information, you can at least capture their contact information. You can also even code the landing pages so you can know who went from your direct mail to your landing page and, and know where you're getting response even without people contacting you. But landing pages will dramatically improve the overall response to a direct marketing campaign by giving people another way to respond. As I mentioned, it doesn't have to be mail. FedEx boxes, drop-offs, any way to get the materials to the prospect, to the client are effective. It's just about touching people in a way that's not just electronic. Now for nurturing campaigns, when you're trying to stay top of mind with someone, think about the fact that, hey, I'm going to send you something to interrupt your day. And if I'm going to do that, I better make sure that what I'm sending is a worthwhile interruption. So I want to really add value on nurturing campaigns and send something that's truly worth the prospect's time, not just another sales pitch. Um, now, sometimes I might do skill marketing with my nurturing, but I'd intersperse that with lots of educational content, whether it's blog posts we've recently written or it's a white paper or I'm inviting someone to a webinar. I want to make the interruption worth someone's time every single time. All right, let's switch gears and talk about the most used and abused marketing tool there is, email. So email, despite the fact that all of us have inboxes that are filling by the minute here, it's still a great marketing tool. In fact, of all the tools we're talking about, it tends to have the highest return on investment. That's because you can get email out the door for very, very low cost. It also has incredibly fast response. I'm going to get the vast majority of response to an email within 24 hours and usually within 48 hours, that's all I'm going to get. So if I want to test a message, test a promotion, um, test any crazy idea, I'll test with email because I can know in less than two days, did the idea we sent out work? Did it resonate with people? Did they open the email? Did they read through? Did they click on the link? Does it work? I practically, I will use that sometimes to figure out, hey, what should we be doing for our paid advertising? What should we be doing for our direct mail? Let's test with email to see what kind of a response we get. Email is great for direct selling, whether it's used by salespeople to advance the sale, whether it's used as part of marketing to skill market. I can do things that immediately ask for a job order with email and immediately get the job order. But likewise, it's really good for relationship building. Uh, we talked about using direct mail as a way to nurture relationships. Well, email is the same thing. It's just a lot less costly. So in an ideal nurturing campaign, I'd direct mail people once in a while, and I'd email very consistently, at least once a month, where I'm doing something that adds value, that's worth the time of day that I'm interrupting, share something really good, share some, as you see on screen, great ideas, strategies for success, something that when I'm interrupting someone's day, they're going to say, you know what? This is worth five minutes to me because I'm going to learn something that's useful and beneficial. Um, one thing I, I would say is don't just tell people, hey, we have a newsletter. No one wants a newsletter. Make sure that if you have a company newsletter, it's somehow branded. It's branded to you. It's branded to some benefit that you're talking about the value you're delivering. Nobody wants your newsletter, but they do want great ideas to make their business more profitable. They do want strategies for success and to learn how to manage their workforces more cost efficiently. Email is also terrific for staying top of mind. You can email people m multiple times a month without getting on their nerves. And there's no magic answer as to what's the right number. Uh, we do different numbers, and we kind of we watch opt-outs. And if we start seeing a lot of opt-outs, that tells us, oops, we did too many that month. In general, in our own marketing, we'll email three to four times a month. 
Um, and most of you know, you get it from us. You don't read all of them, but you read from time to time. You read enough to be on today's webinar. So with your regular email marketing, you want to think about the different purposes. Do I want promotional emails? Do I want top candidate emails? Do I want educational newsletter-ish style emails? Uh, do I want news alerts? Or do I want to share salary updates? What's my email marketing calendar look like? When am I going to do it? How am I going to do it? What kind of content? But my goal is to stay top of mind with most of the interruptions are extremely valuable. In terms of designing a successful marketing email, key number one is to make sure it's short. Short text, short sections. People, when they read your email, are going 100 miles an hour, so you want to make sure that it's really easy to read. I want to make sure that anything I'm sharing is very relevant, that I'm writing about topics of interest that matter to the reader, not necessarily what I'm trying to sell. Sometimes those will overlap, like if I'm skill marketing top candidates, but other times it may have nothing to do with what I sell. And other times I want to teach people to be an expert at what I sell. So if I'm in recruiting, I want to teach people how to be expert recruiters because in the process of doing that, I show people how hard it is to be really good and I demonstrate my value. I want to be timely. If there's a new employment law update that's affecting your state or your local city or a federal law, tell your clients about it right away. Show them you're an expert at employment law and you're going to help them stay on top of what they need to know. If there's best practices and trends in compensation, benefits, retention, show people you're on top of those trends. Personalize it. Write to an individual. Have some sort of introductory note so it's not generic that you're talking to John Smith at ABC Corporation. Uh, and talk to them personally. And it should be from someone in your organization. Don't make it generic. Have big calls to action. You see the examples on screen are a couple of email newsletters that our clients use. And that one has big green buttons, the other has a big orange button. And the idea to the big buttons is when I'm viewing this email on mobile, well, those big buttons are not huge anymore, but they are big enough for me to push uh, easily while I'm using and reading the email on my mobile phone. Speaking of which, make sure your emails are optimized for mobile. I get lots of emails from staffing companies that are not designed to be optimized for mobile. Nobody wants to pinch and stretch their emails to try to read them, they're just going to delete them. So if your email doesn't adjust for mobile, if it isn't responsive, then you're not going to get very good readership. Figure that 50 to 70 percent of the people opening your email are doing so on a mobile device. So you want to make sure they look great, they're easy to use, they're easy to read on a mobile device. And then try to mix up HTML and text. HTML are emails with pictures, like you see on screen, and text is just what it sounds like, plain text. And we found that, that usually you know, one plain text email as a follow-up to a great HTML email is really, really effective because the text looks more personal, the email has better branding, the email is better for drawing people to take actions, but the text is better as a as a follow-up to reinforce it because of that more personal. So the combination of the two is the best way to go about email marketing. And lastly, drive people to specific landing pages where they can take action. They can download something. They can sign up for a webinar. Um, they can look at the profile of a top candidate. They can review a job. They can contact you for services. Don't just send them to the homepage of your website. And if you're sending people to a blog post, make sure that blog post is optimized like a landing page so there are calls to action in the post for what actions you want them to take after reading. When you do a sales email, it's a little bit different. So they're almost all going to be plain text, but you want to make sure here they're scripted. Give your salespeople emails that work. Look at the emails, have them brainstorm. Hey, what emails have we written that have had the best impact? And make a library of those emails. So whether it's the follow-up to an appointment, or reach out for a first meeting, or presenting a candidate, or getting feedback on a candidate, what emails work. Now, it doesn't mean they have to literally follow the script 100%, but use the script as a foundation for what they write. Have them try emailing to people off hours. You may get a lot more response from senior leaders at 10 p.m. than you do at 10 a.m. I know I do. I know I'm also more responsive. Sometimes it's 7 a.m. or at 10 p.m. than I am at 10 a.m. The reason is you're going to get me when I'm not doing 25 other things. And likewise, with your clients, you want to get them at the time that 
they're not doing every other part of their job because they're more likely to respond to your sales email. Write very short paragraphs and ideally no more than five sentences. So the sample on screen here sort of fails this test. And the reason it fails this test is the sentences are a little too long, the paragraphs are a little too long, and there's more than five sentences. But what we did to compensate, because we couldn't tell the message in five sentences or less, it's only, it's only a few longer than that, uh, we added bold headlines to separate it to make it easy to skim. Now, if I was going to rewrite the email on the screen, I still would make the paragraphs even shorter. Very often on, in sales emails, we'll do one sentence as a paragraph. Now, it's terrible grammar, but it makes it really easy to read on mobile. And if it's really easy to read, people keep reading. And be specific about the actions you want people to take. You can see in the sample email, it's just a text email, but we made contact online or email me hot links. So people could just click on that to take an action. We also included in the PS on the right a bunch of other free do downloads. Maybe they don't want to talk to us yet, but maybe they, they are interested in getting more information. So we send them to a bunch of resources and we show they're just plain URLs. We're not doing any fancy tracking here, but we just want to make it easy for people to take action as a next step to keep them engaged with our firm. All right, let's change gears again. Let's talk about sales collateral. Now, sales collateral is really interesting in staffing. I talk to some people who think, oh, we absolutely must have good sales collateral, and other organizations say, why in the world do we want sales collateral? It's out of date. I, I don't want people relying on tools like that. We have no need because our salespeople are really good at selling. Well, I think sales collateral does have a lot of value in staffing today. So it's really ideal for telling your story the way you want it told. It's ideal for presenting your capabilities um, and specifically in cross-selling so that if you staff in five different vertical markets, well, whatever somebody has purchased from you the first time, let's say it was light industrial staffing, they think that's all you do. So when we cross-sell or when we create use collateral to present a range of capabilities, we can cross-sell those other capabilities to our existing clients. There's also ways to use different formats to more effectively cross-sell from one area of an organization to another. Well-designed sales collateral strengthens your positioning. It reinforces what you said. It repeats the story sales tell. It corroborates what's on the website. Essentially, they go hand-in-hand -hand to tell your story to demonstrate your positioning as efficiently as possible. Queen Consulting, I mean, I love this example. Their brochure uses the exact same imagery as their website, and it's fun imagery. It gets your attention. It does not look like your typical staffing company, um, but it conveys who they are, what they do, and their brand very clearly, very concisely, in an easy-to-read format. And most importantly, it's got to help the salespeople. Help them more consistently tell your story the way you want it told. Um, help them more effectively make a presentation, but at the same time, you have to train your salespeople. Don't let it become a crutch. So when someone says, hey, just send me some information, they don't use that as, a, oh, I sent a brochure and I'm done. No, you know, I want to ask people, well, what kind of information do you send? Well, what questions are you looking to answer? I'll be happy to get you that. Just let me, let me know exactly what you're looking for and I'll get you the right information. And then to make sure that they're following up appropriately on that information to ask follow-up questions after they've sent it. The other thing I love about sales collateral is we tend to think about it being just brochures, but you know, there's so many formats. Even in brochures, you've got bifolds, trifolds, gatefolds, z-folds, accordion folds, booklets, so many different formats of brochures. Go Google brochure folding and you'll see all the different ways somebody might make a brochure to present information with different styles. There are pocket folders, which are great if you do formal presentations or you respond to RFPs and, you have to, and you're not doing them online. They make a really nice presentation or a leave behind to have a professional pocket folder where you insert some information about your firm. Sell sheets, just simple one-pagers. This is, you know, I mentioned a minute ago cross-selling. So if I've got sell sheets that are focused on specific services or industries that we sell to, and I'm trying to present to an industry that I'm not known for, I'm trying to cross-sell a service to an existing client, I can just share the sell sheet for that new service with the client and say, hey, I don't know if you know, we do, do this as well. I can say, wow, look, I didn't know that you do clerical staffing as well as light industrial. I didn't know you had an IT recruiter on staff. Good to know. And it's, it's the collateral materials, even though your salespeople may say these things, the collateral materials support them and help reinforce the different things that you can do. Uh, PowerPoint, another presentation 
materials. Great for educational presentations. Now, I don't like them that much when people use them as an overview of here's who we are and why we're wonderful because nobody wants to sit through that kind of a PowerPoint. But if it's an educational presentation on uh, trends in hiring for 2017 or best practices in workforce planning, something that you can train a client on, those presentation decks are invaluable because they give the sales team something to walk through with the client that's highly valuable. And somewhere in that presentation, you're going to talk about the value of staffing as a solution to a problem the client has. Case studies, another form of sales collateral that far too many, or excuse me, far too few staffing companies use. And if they do use them, they don't have enough of them. How do you demonstrate the value of your services? How do you prove that you've done this before in specific industries or specific types of clients? The answer is by collecting case studies. Demonstrate the problems your clients had, the solutions you developed, and the return on investment that you delivered. And create as many different case studies as you can. And then create them in print format, electronic format, add them to your website so that you can have this collateral that your sales team can leverage whenever they need it to help build credibility with a prospect. Likewise, white papers. Uh, white papers might be about staffing. They might be about recruiting. Uh, if you break down the elements of staffing to sourcing, vetting, interviewing, part of vetting, onboarding, orientation, think about every single thing that you are an expert at and say, we could have a white paper on this that will be really valuable to our clients. We'll share our expertise. Or maybe we'll just do a survey of our clients to learn their best practices and we'll share that back with them. Um, give them a white paper on industry trends in our local market. That kind of information is great collateral. It's great on your website. It's great to be sent via email. And it's great as a drop off or used in direct mail as well. But that collateral is extremely powerful for helping to enhance your sales function. And lastly, don't forget video. Video is a form of sales collateral. It doesn't have to be a commercial. It can be educational. Um, one of my favorite social media guys, uh, Gary Vanderchuk, and I apologize for those of you who know him. I'm butchering the pronunciation of his last name. But Gary does amazing videos on how to be a better marketer. Now, he's got a kind of crass style, but he's really good. And his video is his sales collateral. It makes you want to work with him because he conveys his brand through his videos. And you can do the same thing through your videos. Or maybe you're using video as a way to skill market a top candidate or to present a job. That is a form of sales collateral that you can use to generate more response to your selling and your recruitment marketing. So how do you de design really good sales collateral? First, focus on the client, not you. It's about their problems, their challenges, their interests, not what you can do. So write materials that start with the client. Second, tell a story. Make it engaging reading. Uh, make it a parable if you have to. But make it about something that's not just staffing, but it's about a real-world problem, a real-world interest that the client can relate to. Make it easy to read. Short paragraphs, big headlines. I can skim it. Lots of pretty pictures so that it's super easy for me to go through the materials and get the message without having to sit down and read, 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 because that feels like work. Um, I equate a lot of good sales collateral to almost being like a children's picture book. If there's a one or two sentences per page with a big picture that reinforces the message, that's more powerful than if there's just two or three pages that are crammed with text. So I'd rather make it easy to read, it might cost a little more to produce, although not anymore if I'm doing it electronically, but I'm going to get more impact because of the readability of the piece. Make sure the content and the format match the purpose. So if I'm trying to educate, I want a PowerPoint presentation. If I'm trying to show somebody, here's the other things that I can do, well maybe I want a capabilities brochure or a sell sheet. Uh, if I'm trying to just give a quick tip, maybe I want a video or a blog post. So thinking about all of the different formats of collateral, and when we get to at the end, talking about how to design your own strategy, how do I fit the appropriate tools in to support how we are selling? I want to all ideally have stuff where there's small or no in inventory, stuff I can order digitally on demand. I love beautiful printed pieces, but if you have to buy 10,000 copies to get a decent price and you're not going to use them, uh, don't do it. When we order print, we try to order no more than we'll use in one calendar year. After that time, if you haven't used it in a year, you tend not to use it. And it just gets thrown out or it 
fades and doesn't look good. So try to keep an inventory of no more than a year for any piece. And if you can do things digitally, you only print what you need when you need them. And talk to your sales team. What do they need to supplement their presentations? Where are they losing prospects? Do they need to tell a more compelling story? Do they need a leave behind after a call? Do they need something they can drop off and then follow up on? Where are they having challenges in their sales function that you can assist them with? All right, now we're gonna take a giant jump from print to back to the world of online and understanding search engine optimization. Now this is super technical, not what we're gonna talk about today, but the field of SEO. And I'm gonna give you just a taste of how SEO is used in staffing and recruiting. So what is the value? Well, it's to get found by people who are actively doing a search for the type of services you provide. So see on screen, top staffing firm in Seattle and you know there's Terra Staffing Group first company listed. You want to make sure people are finding you when they're doing a search for the kinds of services you provide. But that's not the only way to think about SEO. Your clients and candidates use search engines every single day. Do you know how they're using them? Do you know what they're searching for? Because what you want to do is try to make your company a source for answers to the questions they're asking to Google. The more you know about how people search, the more you can design your website to have content that will show up in their search results and the more traffic you'll drive to your site. You know, the keys to successful SEO are to really understand your clients and candidates. What are their problems? What are their interests? What are their challenges? Not just staffing, but the stuff they deal with every single day. Don't be overly focused on being number one for one or two keywords because that might not be the keywords your prospects are using. I mean, just finding a staffing company, you know, do you want to be number one for staffing company, staffing agency, temp agency, temp help agency, temp help agencies? There's so many different ways to search for a company that does what you do. And too often companies will tell us, well, I did a search for, for staffing in um, Portland and I didn't see us. Okay, but you're number one for temp help in Portland. So you don't know and, and you want to look at and you do the homework to figure out what are people really searching for. And also you want to look at a really key metric, and which is just not where do we rank for keywords, but what is our total traffic coming from search engine and is it constantly going up? If you're, it's not constantly going up, then we have to be doing more to create relevant content for the people we're trying to attract. Do your homework. You have to do research. You have to research the keywords people are using. You have to research how popular those words are and how competitive they are. If they're too competitive and you, you don't, you're not a big company with a huge SEO budget, you're not going to win. So you have to figure out where you can compete and what combination of keywords and keyword phrases you're likely to be most successful with. You want to think about optimizing around a combination of the skills you place people in and the locations you serve. So for example, if I said I wanted to be number one for IT staffing in the United States, it's not going to happen. It's too competitive. But if I want to be number one for IT staffing in Buffalo, New York, then it's much more likely I can be successful. Even better, if I want to be number one for network administrators in Williamsville, New York, which is a suburb of Buffalo, I've got a great probability that I can be number one for that search. And as you can see by my examples, there's so many different ways you could be number one for something that the real goal is showing up in as many different searches as you can over time by constantly adding pages. And speaking of which, you know, the keys to successful SEO is content, content, content. You want to make sure you have pages for every service you offer and specialties that you offer. You want to have pages for every individual location you can so you can optimize those pages around those services, those specialties, those geographic locations. Every job should have its own page. Your job board, if it doesn't already, should automatically do this and optimize that job for SEO. And if yours doesn't do that, contact us. We can help. You want to be doing regular blogging at least once a week adding posts. I was helping brainstorm marketing ideas for a recruiting firm today, they have 18 recruiters. We said, you know, if every recruiter would write one blog post a quarter, that's 54 posts a year, that's more than four a month they would get out of everybody adding some content. So 
everybody in your firm should do a little bit of blogging because the more you're writing about the challenges and interests your clients have, the more you're going to show up in search results. Then you want to try to get others to link their websites to you. Online PR is a great way to do that. Sending out press releases using paid online services will get tons of inbound links to your website. Being a guest blogger or sharing your content with another website that, so it links back to you is another way to get inbound links. The more inbound links you get, the more relevant your site becomes in Google's eyes, the higher you'll rank in search results for certain keywords. And this is one where it pays to get professional help. SEO is complicated and the challenge is, is every SEO consultant will give you different advice. So you really want to get professional help, you want to get someone who understands your industry, you want to get someone who understands how people are really searching, and then someone who has the tools that they've paid for to do the homework on your behalf to really look at how people are searching and to help you figure out where can we realistically compete. The other challenge with SEO is it's ever-changing. We talked to somebody recently who said, I want to build my website with SEO, I want my SEO to last for five to ten years. It won't. Whatever you do today um, will become start to become obsolete tomorrow. Google changes their ranking algorithms all the time. There are hundreds of factors they use to rank your site, and our challenge is to constantly be improving the site to make it as relevant as possible. I mean, Google's trying to get to the point where the only thing that matters is content. Now, there are still ways to rank highly that aren't just content, but that's the game Google is really playing is they want you to create really relevant content for your audience. They want you to create a great experience for people on desktop and on mobile, um, but you need someone to help you figure out how to do it right. And if you are not don't have somebody in-house that is a true SEO expert, go outside and get help. All right, let's talk about pay-per-click advertising, the other form of search engine marketing. So pay-per-click advertising is something that isn't used by as many staffing companies, but it is a way you can get a shortcut to the top of your search engine results. You can pay for advertising that will be at the top of a search. You also can use PPC to go after specific people. Maybe it's candidates who applied with you in the past and are in your ATS. Uh, maybe it's people who match a specific demographic profile and I can use LinkedIn or Facebook to target them. It can be a really low cost way to stay top of mind with people who visited your website or people you've contacted in the past. And it can be done on search engines. Google has great ways to do PPC as well as social me media. Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat all offer paid advertising options. The example you see on screen right now is a sample of a remarketing display ad that would appear on Google's advertising network after people have been to 365 Healthcare's website. It's one of the low cost ways 365 uses to stay top of mind. So what are the best uses of pay-per-click advertising? Number one, Google AdWords. Google AdWords are where I target somebody typing a specific search in. Someone who's looking for a specific kind of job or a staffing firm in your geographic market. I'll target those people based on the searches they're doing. But I might also target them based on the kinds of information they're looking for. Whatever keywords they're typing in, not just about a staffing company, but about the problems they're trying to solve, the information they're trying to collect. And again, if you know how people search, you can figure out what AdWords to buy. I can also use Google and Facebook to do something called remarketing. Now you're, you're all familiar with remarketing whether or not you've ever heard the term before. Uh, you know, you've searched for a pair of shoes or a new car and all of a sudden those shoes or that car is haunting you all over the internet. That's remarketing. So when somebody visits your website, you put a little cookie, a tag on their machine and so whenever they go to a related site in Google or they're on Facebook, you can make your advertising display but only to those people who've seen you in the past. Extremely low cost. You know, it's less than a fraction of a penny per impression to keep your brand in front of somebody, and even a low cost for, to get someone to click and come back to your website. And on social media, you can do sponsored content, targeting specific audiences or even individuals. You can support your direct marketing by going after the same people on LinkedIn as you're doing with your direct mail. You can create more engagement with your content by sponsoring it to reach a much wider audience. And particularly for recruiting, sponsoring content, particularly on Facebook, is a great way to not just bring your jobs, but encourage people to look for jobs 
uh, who might not know your company, who might not be a fan of your page yet, uh, who might not even know they're interested in a new job. And let me give you an example of what I mean by that. So the, the two images you see on screen right now are an example of our re-recruiting service where we think about why would someone that we worked with in the past be wanting to find a new job again? And the answer is maybe they don't like their boss. Maybe they, they just had enough. Um, maybe they don't love where they're working. So can we show them an ad on Facebook that gets their attention and can we target it just to people we've had some sort of a relationship in the past, but not candidates who are on assignment with us right now. So we can upload an email list of all those people who we want to reach and give them reasons to come back and check out all the jobs we have available today. This is an example of re-recruiting. So with doing PPC successfully, step one is to clearly define your goals. What do you want to accomplish? Is it recruiting? Is it lead generation? Um, are we trying to get people to apply to a specific job or just express any interest in looking for work. Understand the value of every result. If someone applies to a job, if we get a new candidate and we place that candidate, what's it worth to us? What's the value of a new candidate? If we get a new client, what's the value of a new client? Because what you're ultimately going to look at is how much are we spending on PPC and is that a good return on the investment? And If we don't know the value of a result, we can't figure out the return on investment. Then we need a strategy. How do we get people to react? Social media is so cluttered that if we want to get people to react to our advertising or Google AdWords, if we want to get people to jump to our ads, what will we do? What words will we target? What people will we target? What messages will we send? What visuals will we use? What's our strategy to get people to react? We have to be willing to be bold. If you're boring in your PPC, you're not going to get clicks. Think about videos. Facebook in particular loves video, so we want to make sure if we can to incorporate videos. Now it doesn't have to be a big budget fancy video. Um, we can use very low budget tools, low cost tools to create nice looking simplistic videos that will get people's attention and give them a reason to want to talk to us. And then we want to do lots of testing testing the keywords we're going after, testing how much we're spending for our daily budgets, testing the ad copy, testing the images, testing the time of day. We want to test, 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 and then reinvest in what's working and kill the things that are not. PPC in particular is just an ongoing challenge, an ongoing experiment to figure out what will work best to repeat what's working and kill things off that stop working. And then we want to monitor and adjust regularly. You know, at least once a month, we're evaluating the effectiveness of every campaign. Ideally, once a week, we're taking a look and we're making adjustments to try to make the campaigns more effective, to generate more response for what we're spending. All right, and that brings us to our very last marketing tactic to talk about social media. And I saved the best, the most confused, the biggest for last. Uh, what is the value of social media? Well, it's a communication tool. It's not a media channel. It's a way to talk to people, a way to communicate that's different than email, different than the phone, different than anything else. We can use it to attract and engage people. We can use it to get to people we don't know through our friends' networks, through LinkedIn groups. We can use it to engage people we do know by demonstrating our expertise and finding subjects to talk about and bringing them back to our website. We can use it to open doors with prospects, to get to people who we don't know, to nurture relationships with content and with one-to-one -one messaging. It can be used to strengthen both individual branding for a salesperson or recruiter to build their personal brand as well as strengthen your company's brand and do both at the same time. And the thing I love about social is it's not one-dimensional. It's, it's effective for lead generation. It's effective for lead nurturing. It's effective for recruiting. It can do all the above better than probably anything else we've looked at so far in terms of being able to do all of these things. So keys to successful social media marketing. Number one, know your target audience. Make sure you know them as well as they know themselves. Build those personas we talked about earlier so that you know what content is going to resonate with these people, how to get their attention, how to drive them back to your website. Make sure that what you're sharing is really relevant. And as I mentioned a couple of times, be bold. You know, if your videos, if your images, if your topics don't jump out of their over-cluttered news feed, no one's going to click. So you have to have stuff that really is engaging, really is timely, really is relevant, really addresses problems, and is super interesting. 
the focus is on driving people to your website. So maybe you found some great content on Fast Company or Inc. Magazine or HR.com. It's fine to share that, but don't make that all you share. The majority of your content should be information from your own company's website because you want them back on your home field where you can get them to take the actions you want them to take. Make sure that you spend time every single day building your networks, personally and as a company, so that you are getting more people that you are in touch with. And if you, you know, I love LinkedIn that shows you how many people you're connected to in your first and second and third levels. Well, you can see the power of your network through that message from LinkedIn. So the more people you're connected to and more people they're connected to, the more reach you're going to have when you share on social media. And then on Facebook in particular, use that paid promotion to dramatically extend that reach. You're not going to get that much sharing stuff to your Facebook company page. Maybe 2%, if you're lucky, of your audience will see something you share. But when you put 10 or 20 bucks behind paying to sponsor that content and targeting the audience you want to target, now you can get 10, even 100 times more eyeballs on the information you're sharing than if you're just doing it organically. You want to also make sure you're using the right tool at the right time. So, you know, when you're using LinkedIn, I'm using it primarily for direct selling, to get information, to find and get information about prospects and for direct recruiting. I'm also using it for attracting people through LinkedIn groups and posting on LinkedIn back to our website. So I'm, I'm using it for content marketing to generate inbound leads with people I don't know. And LinkedIn, the posts and the groups are a great way to get to people in the right audience but whom I don't know. I can also use it to nurture by sharing content just as updates so that my network sees what I'm sharing. And I can pay with LinkedIn PPC to do really highly targeted direct marketing, but LinkedIn PPC is really expensive. I watched a LinkedIn webinar and they recommended a daily budget of 200 bucks to figure out if LinkedIn is right for you. I don't know about you, but $6,000 a month is a little rich for me to figure out whether or not I like LinkedIn. Um, so we don't do LinkedIn paid advertising because it's too expensive for our little company. But we do use LinkedIn regularly to draw traffic to us. In fact, our Lunch with Haley webinars, about one third of our attendees typically come from LinkedIn. Very many of those people are not people we know, but we share information in LinkedIn groups to extend our reach to that audience. On Facebook, it's going to be mostly about recruiting, um, showing off your company brand, what it's like to work for you. It can also be used as a great way to target small business owners because for a lot of small business owners, uh, their login to Facebook, their email address is their same as their corporate email address. So I can upload my small business owner list into Facebook and I can target that audience with advertising and I'm probably going to hit a really good percentage of them. Uh, same with recruiting. Most of the resumes have email addresses that match people's Facebook email addresses so I can target people on Facebook uh, whose email address that I have and get my advertising to them. Twitter's a little different. Twitter's, I'm not as fond of just the daily sharing everything that you do. Other people will disagree with me. But I really love Twitter to connect with people who are influencers, to follow companies that are thought leaders so I can learn about my industry, about my clients' industries, to follow companies to see who's hiring, um, so that I can maybe connect with key decision makers and bypass the gatekeeper. Because when a key decision maker is active on Twitter, um, you follow them, you retweet them, and they're very likely to follow you back and you can start to build a relationship with them that's independent of going through the normal corporate channels. And if you need more ideas, watch our webinars. Go to lunchwithhaley.com. Go to the archive, uh, or excuse me, our on-demand webinars, and we have tons. Do a search for social media. You'll find tons of great webinars with hundreds and hundreds of tactics to make the most of social media for both business development, direct selling, and recruiting. All right, and I'm not going to get into any detail, but there are other tools. I don't want to pretend that what we did is all there is in marketing. Uh, on screen now, you're seeing a list of lots of other ideas for marketing. I'm not going to cover them, but this table that you see is part of Haley Marketing's Marketing Best Practices Guide. So go to HaleyMarketing.com after the webinar, go to the freebie section, and download the Marketing Best Practices ebook, and you can see all of these other different ideas for your marketing. And this is by no means a comprehensive list of every way to market, but just ways for you to think about 
more types of marketing that you could incorporate into your marketing mix to, as Chad Holmes said, had at least, at least 12 different ways to generate sales leads. All right, now let's pull it all together and wrap up today's webinar. And by the way, I want to apologize for going so long. I knew this webinar was going to go over time, but I didn't want to shortcut it by not covering all the major marketing tools in as much detail as we have. But now we'll wrap it up in just a few minutes and let's put it all together with how to create a plan for your company. So number one is start with a strategy. Okay, what a strategy mean? What are your goals? What do I want to accomplish? How much revenue do I want to grow by? How many new clients do we need to get? How, get? Get specific with what your goals and when you want to accomplish them by. Then know how you're going to measure success. Is it gross margin dollars? Is it the number of conversions you have? Is it the number of completed forms? Is it web traffic? Is it social engagement? Personally, I like to measure success in terms of we got this many new clients and they generated this much gross margin over the course of a year. Or we got this many candidates and we place these many people into jobs. I like very tangible metrics, but how will you measure success for your marketing? And then you want to look at, based on the goals, what are the best ways to achieve the goals? And that's the strategies. So should we be using direct marketing, direct sales? Should we be using inbound? If inbound, which strategies for inbound make the most sense? Is it through just using social media? Is it through search engine optimization? Are we gonna have a content marketing strategy? What are the strategies? How will we create 12 different funnels of leads or 12 different funnels of ways to accomplish the goals that we've set? Think multidimensional. Okay? How can you get those 12 different ways to drive the results that you want? Can I use mail? Can I use email? Can I use social? Can I use paid advertising? Can I use SEO? What else can I use? Brainstorm tactics with your team. Get a whiteboard, get a bunch of post-it notes and put them up and say, let's think about every specific tactic we can think about to generate the results we want. Put them all up. But when you're thinking about being multidimensional, don't filter yet. Because next you're going to figure out your budget. So you're going to say for each of those tactics, what does it cost to do it right? You know, is this a hundred dollars problem? Is this a thousand dollars? Is a ten thousand dollar campaign we need to create? What will it cost to really do it right? And what results do we need to justify the investment? And so I'm going to give you my sort of back of the envelope way to calculate marketing budgets. I'll look at how to do it right. And let's say, for example, we have a direct mail campaign and it's going to cost ten thousand dollars to do. I'll say, okay, if we're going to spend ten thousand dollars in marketing. I need a multiple on that to justify the investment. So if I'm in staffing, maybe I need $3 in gross margin for every dollar I spend on marketing. So I would need 30,000 in gross margin in order to justify my $10,000 investment. And if my average client is $3,000 in gross margin a year, then I need 10 clients. So would my $10,000 investment get me 10 clients? If the answer is yes, it's a good investment. If the answer is no way, I shouldn't invest. I need to put the money into something else. I usually try to find things where, yeah, we need one, two, five, ten 10 clients, a relatively small number, and we think we're going to get double or triple that amount. So hitting our target ROI is pretty easy. Now, there are some instances where I'll accept a lesser ROI. Maybe if I'm going to a conference, and it's very expensive to go to the conference with the booth costs and the travel costs and the marketing costs, but if the conference just pays for itself, but we get enough future leads that lead to opportunities, or we get an email list that we didn't have, the conference pays for itself, that might be acceptable as well. Now you want to pick the right tactics. You know, what tools are going to be best for each strategy you've selected, which fit your plan budget, and then we want to sort of figure out how to put together a multi-dimensional game plan that's affordable and that will generate the ROI we need to produce. Then from there we'll create our action plans, and this is where a lot of companies stop. They don't go further than this, but you really want to do the action plan. Step one is a marketing calendar where we take everything we're going to do each month and we put it on a physical calendar so we know what the deadlines are for every mail piece, every email, every webinar or other event we're going to attend. It's on a calendar. 
I want to do a content plan, ideally planning probably quarterly for what we're going to write about, what topics of interest, and how we're going to match that to our overall marketing. And then each month we'll plan the specific blog post that we're going to write and when we're going to write them. And then we're going to assign ownership. Who owns each marketing activity? Who has responsibility? And every single thing should be owned by one person. It doesn't have to be owned by the same person, but everything should be owned by one person. And then lastly, you know, what are we going to do ourselves in-house and where are we going to get help and outsource it? And for every company, it's going to be different depending on your time availability, your internal resource capabilities, your, your the technology you have, the tools you have, and the cash you have to invest in outside help. So we'll try to figure out what we do ourselves. That there are certain things that every staffing company you absolutely should keep in house. Um, you know, a lot of recruiters I talk to have very deep industry expertise. A lot of their writing has to stay in house. But a lot of other marketing functions would be cheaper to outsource than to hire somebody to do in house. I see a lot of people hiring, you know, junior level marketing people to do activities that could be outsourced for half the cost of the junior level marketing person and with greater expertise than with the junior level marketing person. So you want to make the decision of what fits the budget and what will most effectively get the result we're looking to achieve. And then we've, we want to make sure that we're tracking our results. So how do we track results? Well, we've got landing pages. We can count how many people visited the landing page. We can use analytics to do that. We can also count the responses we can get. You know, we we at Haley Marketing Group, we keep every email that comes from a landing page. So at the end of the year, we can say, how many inbound leads did we get? Uh, our goal for this year is 800 inbound leads from our landing pages and from our website. So we can be looking every month. Are we on target? If not, do we need to do more with our marketing? I can use Google Analytics to see if I'm not getting the results on our landing pages, what's happening? Where are people entering the site? Where are they falling off? Where do we make me do improvements, better calls to action to get them to take the next step? I can look at social analytics to see are we writing about topics that people are engaging with? Are we doing the right things at the right times to hit our audience? I can look at the lead source in our CRM systems and make sure the sales team is entering a lead source. So we record where every single lead comes from so that over time we can look at and say, what sources, what marketing sources are generating the best inbound leads. And we can kind of look at it in terms of quantity as well as going through each lead and looking at it in terms of quality. And then we can also look at marketing automation, not just to track the results, but to automate follow-up to say, hey, will we get more response by using automation to say, are we creating better engagement with people? Are we bringing people back to the site with campaigns? Um, are, and also to make sure we're notifying the sales team when individuals have a certain level of engagement with our content, our emails, and with our website. And then finally, we want to make sure we test and reinvest things that are working. So testing every tactic. We never assume that what we did yesterday will work tomorrow. Everything is a constant ongoing experiment. And we're doing A-B testing. We are constantly creating little experiments uh, with different versions of landing pages, different versions of emails, testing subject lines, testing blog posts content to see what works best for us. And then we just, we do more of what works and we keep doing it until it stops working. And I see a lot of companies that will abandon marketing because they get bored with it, but it's still working. We designed a marketing campaign for one company. It was expensive, but they used it for 10 years. So if you took the average cost per year, it was next to nothing. You know, I think it was less than $1,000 a year. And this campaign produced $2 million in business in the first six months. So if we do more of what works and we keep doing it, that's how we maximize our ROI. And with that said, um, we will open it up for questions. And for those of you who have gotten to that point, I'm now going to let you in on a little secret. What we're doing right now is actually a re-record of today's webinar um, because David Cerns, person who's done webinars for seven years, uh, I made a huge rookie mistake earlier today. And when we did it, I forgot to hit the record button. So now I am sort of like uh, Wayne and Garth from Wayne's World sitting in my basement in uh, Williamsville, New York and uh, re-recording this webinar. So there's not going to be any live questions, but if you do have questions after the event, um, after you listen to this, 
don't be shy. Give me a call. Better yet, send me an email. I will be more than happy to address questions about anything that we've talked about today. I want to thank everybody who's been part of listening to this webinar. I hope you found great value in it. Also, coming up next for the month of March 2017, we have two phenomenal webinars. We have uh, High Velocity Hiring. I am going to have the privilege of doing a one-on-one -on -one live interview with Scott Wintrip about his new book on how to accelerate the hiring process. And then uh, a couple weeks after that, we will be doing lessons from the Executive Forum. Uh, we had three guys who went to the Executive Forum a couple of weeks ago. And on Thursday, March 23rd, we'll be sharing uh, the lessons that we learned from this uh, fabulous industry event. So if you weren't able to go, book your calendars for next year. Uh, it's in Miami Beach, so it's going to be a great location. And uh, join us this year on March 23rd for our Lunch with Haley event. Uh, from all of us at Haley Marketing Group, I really want to thank you for your time today. I hope you enjoyed this webinar, and we look forward to seeing you on a future Lunch with Haley event.